ionizing radiation means uh, that this radiation has sufficient energy to uh, liberate electrons from atoms or molecules, which again makes them uh, reactive and uh, can break apart bonds, can break apart molecules. So uh, that's a vital thing and the uh, um, biological effects which will result from that in the end. Um, there's also um, visible light, of course, which is not ionizing, as we know. Uh, it only has the power to excite the atoms, so it can um, lift an electron to a higher orbital, but not remove it. You probably know this effect from fluorescence or phosphorescence, like glow-in-the-dark powders and everything, where you can see a, a nice afterglow later on, which happens as the electrons jump back to their ground state, and the energy difference between those two orbitals are released in the form of a photon, in the form of a light photon in that case. But we also have these jumps uh, in the form of X-rays and stuff later on, we'll sort of see. So um, about the types of ionizing radiation, we already had the electromagnetic spectrum with the photon radiation. Um, there's uh, gamma radiation, which is released from the nucleus after a radioactive decay in a lot of cases. It depends uh, if, the, if the atom is in an excited state, which depends on, on the actual decay. Usually um, it's an uh, alpha or beta decay in most cases, where uh, alpha decays happen in heavy atoms usually, and uh, beta decays happen in other unstable nuclei. If there's a neutron excess, it'll be a neutron converted into a proton, giving off an electron, or you can convert a proton into a neutron in the case of a proton excess, which will give off the antiparticle of the electron, the positron. And Interesting stuff happens, but more about that later. Um, what also happens is uh, the X-rays. The, the only difference between X-rays basically is that they are originating from, from the electron shell. So by the interaction of ionizing radiation, beta particles, um, you know that from X-ray tubes where you pretty much just apply a high voltage, accelerate electrons to a certain levels um, that they can actually liberate uh, electrons from the atom or produce X-ray, X-ray is by other means, Bremsstrahlung. Um, yeah, so uh, particle radiation, as I said, in the form of usually decays. Alpha, beta radiation are charged particles. Neutron radiation are uncharged particles. Um, what is also important to note is that with the, um, with the particles, uh, you have a, a specific resting mass, which uh, equals to a resting energy. The energy of a resting electron or positron would be 511 kilo electron volts. That's just a unit that you have to know. And uh, they also get a kinetic energy, a movement energy, in the form of that radioactive decay. And um, they can have varying energies. And the nucleus can be left with uh, varying excitation energies, which give off uh, as gamma rays afterwards, and that can lead to characteristic fingerprints of the elements, different gamma energies. Sometimes there are no gamma energies, but that's rather rare. So um, that's, the, that's a basic principle of gamma spectroscopy. Now, um, interaction of radiation with matter. This is, by the way, by no means complete. There's much more to that, but I'm just focusing on the, on the most important aspects we already discussed. The X-rays, uh, you can have characteristic X-rays, which are also important in determining elements by uh, specific means. These uh, happen when um, a beta minus particle or just an electron and I don't know, an X-ray tube or an electron microscope is accelerated to ionize an atom. So it liberates um, the uh, electrons from a lower shell, which are then uh, producing gaps in the shells, basically. And those are filled up by, uh, by higher electrons, and the energy difference, again, sort of similar in the, like in the phosphorus sense that we discussed before, is given off uh, in the form of a photon, but this time it's a highly energetic photon, so it's an, it's an X-ray, it's ionizing radiation, and not just light. And Bremsstrahlung X-rays, you can pretty much um, imagine like interactions with the core. You can imagine it like, like planet Earth, for example, and a comet going around it. Um, it gets attracted by or deflected by Earth's gravity. And uh, the same sort of happens to the charged particle, the, the electron, as it gets deflected around the nucleus. It loses energy. That energy difference, is, uh, energy is never lost, as we know from basic physics, uh, is given off in the form of an X-ray as well, so-called Bremsstrahlung, even in English, even though it's a German word. Um, now the beta plus radiation, as I said, the positrons 
are very interesting because uh, they are the antiparticle of the electron. They are also directly ionizing, same as the beta radiation, meaning they have a charge and thus produce um, ions along the way by attracting charges, which is pretty much the electrons from the shell. And um, as, they're, as I said, they are the antiparticles of the electron, so eventually, when they lose all or nearly all of their kinetic energy, they will combine with an electron and uh, have an, uh, matter antimatter annihilation, which uh, leads to the production of two photons with the resting energy of the electron, um, 511 keV, respectively. And uh, they are emitted at an angle of 180 degrees relative to each other, or if there's remaining kinetic energy, this angle may slightly vary. Um, the basic or most important aspects of photon radiation interaction are uh, Compton scattering, or, well, we can start with the uh, photoelectric effect. You can see it's dependent on the, the photon energy as well as the atomic number of the absorber. And the photoelectric effect, uh, the entire energy is transmitted to an electron. The photon disappears, the electron gets ionized and has the kinetic energy of uh, the initial photon, the gamma ray, for example, minus its binding energy. In uh, higher energies, you have uh, the Compton effect, which is just partial transmission of the photon energy to an electron. Again, liberation of the electron, but the photon continues to fly along its path and do the other effects or whatever effects it does. And uh, in the higher energy areas, you also have pair production, which is, again, a photon forming a pair of uh, an electron and a positron, which, again, undergo the effects mentioned above, and of course we need a certain energy for that, which is, again, of course, exactly twice the resting energy of an electron, so for, from uh, 1.022 mega electron volts, or 1,022 kilo electron volts. Um, in the even higher energy areas, the uh, photon can even get to the core and uh, produce a so-called photonuclear reaction, so it can excite the core and uh, either emit another photon, or if the energy of the photon is high enough to uh, sort of liberate one of the weakest bound uh, uh, nuclei from that atom, it can uh, emit a neutron or a proton, for example. And then in these extreme cases, you also have the photon-induced fission, but you need lots of energy for that. We're talking about 100 mega electron volts, maybe. Uh, so you can split an atom like you split them in a nuclear reactor with a neutron, basically, and uh, we don't really do that on Earth because we need a lot of energy to, um, to produce such radiation, but it does happen in stars, for example. Um, alpha radiation, again, we said two protons, two neutrons, so it's pretty much a helium nucleus. It's a, it's a very big particle with two positive charges, so it produces lots of these ions along its path. It has a very short range, thus. Um, and it can even be uh, used to produce neutron radiation. Uh, there are many of these interactions, but this is one of the most inter interesting actions uh, that actually happens. If you have a light material, aluminum works, for example, but beryllium has a better so-called cross-section for the effect, then um, you can have an alpha emitter, and for 100 alpha um, particles that will strike beryllium, you get about 30 neutrons. You actually pretty much force the atoms into each other. They fuse, if you could say. And uh, you produce um, an element with uh, two more protons inside, which will be carbon, and uh, release a neutron in the process of that. This is actually a common way to produce neutron sources to induce nuclear fission, for example. Um, neutron radiation does happen in spontaneous fission of atoms as well, which is rather rare, but does happen in nature, in uranium, for example even though the most common uh, method of decay would be alpha decay. Um, they can either scatter elastically, you can pretty much imagine that like, like playing pool or something. Um, either there is no transmission, no, no transmission of energy to the nucleus, it just gets scattered back and scattered across the way, basically. It happens, for example, in hydrogen. Um, then there's inelastic scattering, where the nucleus um, gets part of that energy of the neutron, gets excited, and then again uh, emits radiation, for example, in the form of a photon again. Or the neutron can even be captured by a nucleus, um, which could result, uh, present in a stable nucleus, so a different isotope of an element, an unstable nucleus, so a radioactive atom, or even in fission of the atom, splitting it into uh, multiple pieces. Uh, after that, there may be multiple emissions of more photons or particles. Now, a nuclear fission. Oh, why do I have these cards anyway? I'll look at them. 
um, in nuclear fission, you have uh, the uh, spontaneous or induced fission, as I already said. It happens naturally as well, but you can induce fission. Usually we do that with uh, neutrons, which is displayed here. So you have uh, a neutron entering uh, uranium-235 core, which will be a highly excited state, uranium-236 core, for just a very short amount of time. And then it'll split into usually two fragments with a ratio of three to two and um, release multiple neutrons in the way as well, as well as uh, lots of energy. 200 mega electron volts of energy are released for a single fission of a uranium atom. And that's why you can easily boil a lot of water and power a turbine with that. Um, nuclear fission, as we know, is used in today's nuclear reactors. A nuclear fusion is uh, not uh, splitting atoms, but merging atoms with uh, less of an energy release in that reaction. It happens in, in stars like our sun and produces elements up to iron 56, which is the uh, least exothermic reaction that can occur. Every other element, the golden marriage ring you might be wearing, is uh, produced in, an, in a much more extreme event in space, which I'll just mention later as well. So basically what you do is you create a plasma, which is stripping all the electrons of the atomic nuclei, and then you force them into each other. You can imagine this maybe like, like magnets, you know? You can force magnets with the same poles into each other if you just apply enough force, but uh, the magnets will fall apart once you sort of let go of that force. In the atom, it's a little different. There's a different force. Uh, the magnet force, you can imagine, is the Coulomb force, which repels atoms and usually prevents them from just crashing into each other. But um, you can, you can overcome that force, and if they're just close enough together, the strong nuclear force uh, grabs them. It's stronger than the repellent Coulomb force if they're very close to each other and uh, binds the new, newly created nuclei together. So you can see here uh, tritium and uh, deuterium fusion reaction, for example. But uh, I think I'll actually leave that fusion stuff to Will Jack, who is going to hold an amazing lecture after mine, so you should definitely... Uh, be here and check that out. Now we're going to continue with the effects of ionizing radiation. Uh, the physical effects we already discussed, the ionization of atoms and molecules. Uh, the chemical effects then, which would be the radiolysis of water, for example, and the production of uh, free radicals, so as we have uh, a, uh, what was that one called, hydroxyl radical, for example which are very reactive molecules, and uh, they just want to fill up uh, that, that one empty electron shell by any means. Uh, they don't care whatever is nearby. So you, you basically consist of water, but um, it doesn't matter if you, use, uh, if you lose one, one water molecule or whatever, but if, if the nearby molecule is your DNA, and that uh, radical just happens to grab an electron from that DNA, then it causes damage to the DNA, which is not that good. So DNA damage cell death or mutations or activation of genes, for example, may occur. Um, but DNA damage happens from the food that we eat a lot of time as well. Like, you've probably heard of acrylamide and all that kind of substances that actually uh, lead to the production of free radicals and uh, the same effects as if it was caused by ionizing radiation, so DNA damage and everything. But the good thing is that uh, living cells have efficient repair mechanisms. So you can, uh, if there is a base is lost, you can pretty much replace it because it's only one uh, that will fit on the other side. There's, uh, well, a lot of stuff that will take care of that. And if the wrong genes uh, get uh, activated, you will also have uh, a display of this activity on the surface of the cell so the immune system can recognize that cell as uh, doing something wrong and usually uh, will terminate it, will tell it to kill itself, which is called apoptosis. So uh, many potential cancers uh, arise in you every day, but your immune system usually takes good care of that. Now, how to detect ionizing radiation? Um, most simple one is probably the ion chamber, which is pretty much like capacitors. You have uh, two opposing plates, basically, anode and cathode and uh, apply it high voltage. If there's an incident radiation entering, that's, for example, an electron, it produces these ions along the path, so the positively charged uh, nuclei and the electrons, which are quickly um, attracted to the, to the anode due to the applied high voltage. And then you can measure either a constant flow of current or a single pulse from that. You actually have different regions to operate these chambers. You have, um, well, 
the area of recombination. Uh, the voltage applied is, is not in a total um, scale because it depends on the type of detector. If you're using air or uh, high pressure gas, how big the detector is um, and so on. So it's, it's not possible to, to have a general statement of the exact voltage, but just the areas. Um, first of all, you have the area of recombination where um, the, the applied voltage is not enough to pull apart the charges, so they may just uh, recombine uh, with other charges that might be uh, positive or negative charges. Um, then you have the ion chamber region, uh, which is this region, which uh, pretty much manages to, to separate the inv individual charges, but uh, causes no amplification. Then you have the proportional area, where uh, you will have um, a proportional amplification, so that means the, the electrons near the anode will have enough energy to ionize other um, molecules again, molecules of the fill gas, and thus produce a larger amount of electrons, giving a larger pulse, but it's still proportional to uh, the incident radiation. But in a Ganga counter region, you have an unproportional amplification. So the electrons have so much energy, they will uh, lead to these intense effects like uh, ionizing of uh, lower shells of other, uh, of other atoms, uh, UV radiation, other photons ionizing more molecules, and in eventually a big electron avalanche that just leads to one huge single pulse that occupies the entire, entire anode for a while. But it's very good for detecting uh, very low levels of radiation, such as our ambient levels of radiation due to the great amplification. Um, and we have the uh, scintillation counters. Um, <clears throat> you uh, pretty much can imagine this like, like a little crystal. Uh, I can show you one of them later on in my workshop if you want. I have them with me, um, where the photon radiation um, pretty much strikes in, in the case of sodium iodide, and uh, produces a little, a little flash of light. You know cascade of things that happen. Uh, pretty much you have sodium iodide that is doped with uh, thallium as luminescent centers, where the excited atoms will de-excite in a, in a certain way, in a certain uh, gap between electron excitation levels that will um, give off a specific wavelength of light, which the attached uh, photocathode is sensitive to. Then uh, that radiation will produce a number of electrons released from the photocathode, which will be accelerated via the attached dynode cascade and eventually lead to a pulse as well. These poles are proportional to the incident radiation, so it can be used to see the specific fingerprint of the element, the gamma spectroscopy. And you also have the uh, semiconductor detectors, um, which are very expensive usually and have to be uh, cooled because they're conductive at room temperature, um, but they're um, more efficient or more... Uh, well, not really more efficient, but more, what do you call it? Um, the energy resolution is better, so they produce narrower pulses. We can, we can look at that in the next picture, actually. Um, the issue with uh, sodium iodide, which you can see here, this is a gamma spectrum of sodium iodide. You can see two gamma peaks, which are uh, very characteristic for this element, cobalt-60. It has very two characteristic gamma energies, um, versus the uh, peak from the same nucleid produced in germanium detectors. The peaks of uh, sodium iodide are rather broad, as you can see. This is due to statistical fluctuations. Um, as I said, the, uh, the photons produce flashes of light, but it produces like, for each kilo electron volt of radiation or of energy deposited in that detector, you get, let's say, five to 10 photons. And then these uh, photons, each single photon produces, let's say, um, seven to 12 uh, electrons uh, in that, in that uh, photocathode and, and so on and so on. So you have statistical fluctuation, which eventually lead to very broad peaks, while in a semiconductor, you have a, a very nice energy resolution of in the middle, the full width at half maximum is the middle of the peak, basically. You have an energy resolution of two kilo electron volts in the uh, germanium detector and 55 kilo electron volts in the uh, sodium iodide spectrometer, so you're not able to tell apart peaks that are very close to each other as well in those detectors. But therefore, they're cheap and don't need cooling. Um, one last thing before we get to the videos is pretty much the units that you have to know, which is, uh, first of all, the, the beaker row, which is the decays per second as defined for within the sample, and a radioactive sample. The Curie is just uh, an old-fashioned unit or a unit, I think it's used in the US still, 
um, versus the, the counts per second or counts per time unit in general, can be per minute, whatever you want, as measured in a detector, which is not equal to BKRL because you can only measure a certain amount of radiation from a given source in a detector. Even if you surround it fully, not every gamma quantum will cause an interaction. Some will just go through without causing a single interaction, so you can never measure uh, the actual BKRL with a detector. Um, now there's also the energy in gray, which is the uh, energy dose as deposited in mass. Uh, the sievert, which is the equivalent dose resulting from that, which is just uh, gray multiplied by factors, radiation weighting factors. As we said, alpha radiation produces a lot of ions along the path. It has a very high ionization capability, so it has a higher radiation weighting factor than uh, photon radiation or electrons, for example. Now, the normal radiation levels in Berlin, like in this room, are 0.1 to 0.3 microsievert per hour, which is important to num number to remember for the next videos. Um, in a Chernobyl disaster, many Peter Bicarel is 10 to the power of 15 Bicarel of radioactive material were released to the environment. Many of these radionuclides had short half-lives, like iodine-131, which is well known, which has a half-life of about eight days, so it's long gone now. Um, plutonium isotope with half-life of thousands of years were released. Uh, a large amount of today's activity is from strontium-90, which has a half-life of 28 years, pure beta emitter. Uh, and, but the largest source is that you can measure is from cesium-137, which is a mixed beta-gamma emitter and has a nice uh, gamma line of 662 keV, which can be very well measured in the gamma spectrometer. Now, here's a video about uh, Kopachi village, which was pretty much entirely torn down after the Chernobyl incident. It's about eight kilometers away from the nuclear power plant, and it was, nah, and it was so contaminated that it uh, tore down most of these buildings. There's a little memorial, which you can see, and the radiation levels 0.7, 0.8 microsievert per hour. And that's near the kindergarten, where we have about two microsievert per hour. But, um, well, most of the stuff was buried, decontaminated and everything. And uh, you don't, you have to keep in mind that it was long gone, so, so the very short lived isotopes are long gone. And in the building you can see we have almost normal ambient radiation levels. Uh, so there's not too much contamination in the building, and the concrete shields most of that radiation that is contained within the soil. Now in the main area of Pripyat you can see well, similar radiation levels here, but it totally depends where you go. There are plants which concentrate the cesium-137, for example, so you can see higher radiation levels again, which are similar to that shown in the kindergarten, and in the buildings again. You have pretty much normal radiation levels, but, well, those are the standard tourist areas where tourists are uh, uh, led to. Um, this is the famous Ferris wheel of Pripyat, and slightly higher radiation levels, but you will find these hot spots, for example, as I said, moss, or uh, this should be an underground sewer pipe that um, pretty much collected some of that radioactive material, so you can see those rates of 30 microsievert per hour, so that's very, very great fluctuations of the radiation levels that you can actually find there. Right at the sarcophagus, you only have radiation levels of about 13 microsievert per hour, but that is because everything was totally decontaminated, people actually working there, building the new sarcophagus, and uh, there's a layer of concrete that pretty much seals the old, totally contaminated concrete beneath it. So that's why you can pretty much safely stand there and receive less radiation than in uh, locations maybe eight kilometers or something away from the reactor, but that is, as I said, due to decontamination measures. The higher radiation levels, um, uh, for example, in the red forest, which is called the red forest because of the, uh, the trees that actually turned red due to the intense doses of ionizing radiation. And uh, believe me, you need a lot of radiation to kill a tree, much more than you need to kill a human. But the entire trees turned red and died off, were then torn down and buried. But you can still find very intense levels of radiation. This is just as we're entering the red forest. And you can see those rates are increasing. 10 microsievert per hour and on. And as we get out of the car, you can hear what that sounds like. It's a lot of clicks within the gang counter. That's just an alarm that goes off, and you can see it's like 
80 microsievert per hour for standing there. And in some spots where there's not as much soil covering everything, you can even see we have hundreds of microsieverts per hour, like 300 microsieverts per hour there. But it totally depends where you go. You can even have uh, 1,000 microsieverts or millisievert range. And yeah, these, these levels of radiation are still quite intense nowadays. Now what you can also find there is um, hot spots of material that was uh, blown up from the reactor, basically. Uh, here's such a hot spot where I was already digging around in. And you can see the dose rate increases to quite high levels of hundreds of microsievert per hour, or even millisievert per hour. It's tube overflow now. We have 1.4 millisievert per hour, 1,400 microsievert. This is an energy compensated gamma only device that measured even then a couple of hundred microsievert per hour. And this is the thing that was responsible for it. So if I move closer with the gamma scout, you can see that the dose rate increases. So it's just a uniform scream instead of individual clicks on that. It's either a piece of reactor fuel or reactor graphite. Um, I know that because of the specific composition of uh, radionuclides present in it. I can show you that later in the gamma spectrometer. And you can see even with gamma-only energy compensated meter, we have almost three millisievert per hour on top of this tiny fragment of fuel or graphite, whatever it is. Now a lot of you may think I'm fucking crazy for holding that shit in my hands, but <laughs> let's, look at, let's look at why this is not necessarily the case. This is about knowing and limiting your dose. Um, first of all, you can, of course, limit your dose by limiting the time that you stay there. If you stay at one sievert per hour, if you stay one hour, of course, you receive one sievert. If you stay just one minute, you receive the dose of a conventional CT scan, which is not that much, doable. You'll have radiation sickness. And of course, the shielding, which depends on the material. Alpha radiation is easily shielded by a piece of paper. Beta radiation, easily shielded as well, but you've got to be careful that you don't produce too much X-rays by shielding it with very dense material. Now, photon radiation cannot be fully shielded, but only reduced, which is determined by the half value layer, the layer required to shield half of the radiation, which is, of course, dependent on the energy. So for cesium-137, 662 keV, you would need, for example, 6.5 millimeters of lead to reduce the dose to a half. Um, neutron radiation, we already talked about, can be slowed down, captured by light nuclei, for example. And the most important thing, um, in my case at least, is uh, distance. The inverse square law applies, which says that the uh, dose rate is inversely proportional to the square of the distance, or in quite simple terms, uh, if you double the distance, you reduce the dose to just a quarter. And that applies to any point source of photon radiation. Beta radiation has a range of a few meters in air, alpha just centimeters. Neutron radiation can easily go hundred, hundreds of meters in air. Now, if you exaggerate the radiation levels just a little bit, um, because we were measuring gamma-only levels through a thick aluminum um, plate, basically, on the radiation detector, and that detector was at least a centimeter away as it was inside the housing, um, and there's some beta radiation as well, so we could exaggerate the levels to 10 sievert per hour at one millimeter distance, which would be live skin cell distance. Um, that would cause a sunburn to the skin at 30 minutes, so you can pretty much imagine what dose you're receiving uh, when you get a sunburn. You can be very lucky that this is just UV radiation that is not penetrating. If all UV radiation would be gamma, then all life would be instantly terminated on Earth. So, um, well, I would get fatal radiation sickness after 30 minutes of this dose if it was a full body dose, but it's not because, um, you know, where square law applies. Now, the hands of a, an adult are very radiation resistant. There is no red bone marrow, any blood producing cells in there. But the rest of the body, of course, is a different story. So let's see. Um, my body is assumed to be 20 centimeters. That's 200 millimeters away from the source in my hand. Um, now, the inverse squirrel again 10 sievert per hour times uh, 1 millimeter to the power of 2. Well, 1 to the power of 2. So 1, 10 times 1, still 10. 200 to the power of 2, that's a little more difficult, so I'll give you the number, 40,000, 10 divided by 40,000 is, well, 250 microsievert per hour. 250 microsievert per hour, that's pretty much what I was getting for standing in a red forest as well, except that uh, this dose is just calculated for an exaggerated dose and just for 20 centimeters difference uh, to the source. 
Well, of course, it wouldn't be a full body dose. Well, in the red forest, this is a full body dose. And most people are totally freaking out about me holding this fuel fragment, but they're not so much freaking out about being in the red forest, even though that produces a higher dose, as you can see. And that is because, as we said, the inverse scroller only applies to point sources of radiation. We can look at that again in this little demonstration. You can see, I actually need this for the numbers. Um, we're starting off with about 150 microsievert per hour here. It's very hard to see, sorry about that. You can see it better in my YouTube videos, I guess. Um, and at the end point, moving that much closer, you can already see 650 microsievert per hour. So we're not letting it adjust. It actually needs a while to calculate the dose, but just as a rough example, you can see here we're starting off at almost 300 microsievert, 285. And as I get closer to the ground, with about the same distance in between, you can see we just end up with about 400 microsievert in the end. That is because it's a huge, uniform field of radiation, uh, not a single point source. Point source could be uh, roughly classified as if the source is uh, 10 times smaller than your detector, roughly. Um, now, reactant nucleates like season 137 or plutonium isotopes are very rare in nature. Um, they are basically man made isotopes. Radiation levels similar to those in and around Chernobyl cannot be found in nature. Really? Well, let's check out that. So um, my total dose for Chernobyl, while well, I did really extreme stuff, I also visited an old uh, Soviet plutonium nuclear bomb laboratory and everything, and the dose I received there was not too low as well, let's say. You can see that on my YouTube channel as well, this, this video. Um, was 0.3 millisievert for a couple of days. Uh, the average person in Europe gets about two millisievert per year from natural sources and industrial sources. The most naturally radioactive place, however, is uh, in Ramza in Iran. I'm talking about naturally radioactive, not about the, the nuclear program from Iran and any mishaps that may happen there. So um, they get 250 millisievert a year as an average dose there due to natural radioactive materials, which I'll talk about later. Uh, 20 millisievert per year, however, is considered the maximum permissible uh, dose as a full body dose for working with radioactive material and is then considered as dangerous as working with heavy machinery and chopping your arm off or, uh, I don't know, working with dust in a bakery and just getting lung cancer from that or whatever kind of stuff. But if you look for at studies on the internet, you will find that there are no non-negative effects of these elevated levels of radiation exposure, while you would assume from, from this limit, basically, that there should be increased risk for, for example, cancer. There are other places in the world that are not naturally radioactive. For example, Kerala in India and Gorapari in Brazil. Now, I've been to Gorapari. Let's have a look at those. This is the beautiful city of Gorapari with beautiful Brazilians going about their everyday life. And, of course, they have beautiful beaches as well where they will uh, chill out and relax all day. You can see just a normal tourist beach and everything. Young women covering them in this oddly black sands, black and orange sands, whatever that is. Let's, let's see what that is. I'm going there with my Geiger counter. And there's that <laughs> man over there. <laughs> and you can see 50 microsievert per hour. That's as much as in the exclusion zone of Chernobyl, where nobody is supposed to go. 55 microsievert per hour, and that guy is sitting there in his underpants and irradiating his balls. So um, I'm taking a sample of this stuff. <laughs> And uh, having it analyzed in an uh, uh, institute in Berlin to have the specific activity determinated, um, I can show uh, this, these papers to people who are interested in that. I have them on uh, stuff on, online. Um, Thorium-232, the gate chain, which is the natural radioisotope present in there, is present with 100,000 beaker oil per kilogram. So in one kilogram of that soil, uh, well, soil, sand, which is not too much because sand is rather heavy, you know, um, you have 100,000 of these atoms decaying every single second. Then there's also the radium-226 decay chain, which comes from natural uranium. You see 7.8 beaker oil per kilogram present in that kilogram of sand. And they actually uh, told me that I should rather dispose of this sand as radioactive material, as hazardous material. I should not store it at home. And I actually gave it uh, to my university, and they are presenting it in a glass shield at the safe now. Well, interesting, but okay. Uh, at least it follows the regulations. Um, the contamination as a comparison of surface soil of season 137 in Skatan in Sweden on May the 1st, 1986, after Chernobyl, was 200 kilobeaker per kilogram. 
Now, I chose that because taking the half-life into consideration, it would now have about the same activity levels as uh, the monazite sand in Brazil. However, of course, it was decontaminated as this was considered dangerous. Well, there's more things to consider about that, but let's first of all look at an interview with a medical professional that we did about these sands, uh, these beaches of Gorapari, and why people are just bathing there. Professor, but from a public health uh, perspective, uh, you shouldn't wait for uh, evidence. You're working preventively. These levels are supposed to be dangerous. Well, I'm not so sure that those levels are dangerous. Those levels are naturally occurring radiation levels. And uh, what the, de the decisions regarding evacuation are not only decisions based on scientific uh, uh, understanding of the fact, but also on political, political decisions. If I'm asked as a scientist to say, those levels justified evacuation, I would say, I don't have any evidence to suggest that. Why does he say that? I mean, the exclusion zone of Chernobyl, a radiation level similar to that, um, is an exclusion zone, as it is said, and there are just people going there for tourism and leisure and whatever. So, well, the locals even use it for their health, as they say. Pour la salute, they used to scream at us. Uh, we didn't speak Portuguese, so they had to gesticulate a lot. He was like, I'm sitting down here to cure my back pain because um, they actually go there to uh, cure rheumatism by radiation therapy. We actually do this in, in hospitals in Germany as well. You can see there's even a person, that, I don't know how they got the wheelchair down on that beach like this, but um, yeah, you can see people, disabled people trying to cure themselves, and then there's little children playing in between that. Uh, they're building little sand castles, and then I didn't see anybody decontaminate their hands before they eat a banana or whatever, but well, it's just the way life is on the beaches of Gorapari and in India and stuff as well, I guess. That wasn't an issue. I was surprised as well because it was checked and everything. Then my bag was x-ray checked. It had the label on it. But I, of course, nobody, well, nobody cared. Um, the, the thing is, <laughs> well, the, the thing is that uh, the, the conventional radiation detectors, um, I, I uh, work as a volunteer for civil defense. So we have these probes that are uh, so-called NBR probes, natural background reduction probes. So they pretty much uh, subtract the average of energies of anything that could be natural in order to have the, uh, the the non-natural isotope stick out. So in theory, you could have a shipment of, let's say, I don't know, uranium ore or something like that, and it would be so radioactive, it would overwhelm the detector, but shipping uranium ore is normal for, you know, for enrichment, for reactors, for whatever kind of stuff. But you actually want to see the little source of whatever kind of fissile material, of plutonium in the middle of that, let's say, something like that, something, well, it would have to be something that gives off gamma rays. So you have to subtract everything that could be natural and see inside to, um, have the peak that sticks out from the stuff that is not natural. So I guess that's how it happened, or maybe it never gets checked. <laughs> that's, it's kind of weird, but well, it produced a lot of radiation. I tried to put it in the middle of the suitcase. And well, well, it was just a sand sample anyway. So Actually, it's a case um, that you can just uh, go and, and find yourself some uranium ore in Germany as well. It's, it's not a problem because it doesn't fall under the radiation protection law, but actually under, under the chemicals law. And it's considered, if you, uh, if you don't do anything with it, if you just collect it at home or something, it's called uh, minerals for collection purposes and has no excellent quantity. So in theory, if you just collect it, you can just build yourself a wall out of uranium and get radiation levels like in the beaches of Gorapari, in theory. Interesting laws, yeah, indeed. But once you process it, once you put whatever acid on it or something, then it's uh, handling radioactive material and you have to follow the regulations of the radiation protection laws. Okay, now, anyway, a little excursion to other stuff. Um, where does it all come from? Um, as I said, the heavy elements are created in pretty much the explosions of giant stars, which you can imagine um, once that star has uh, created iron 56, uh, inside. It can no longer fuse the atoms together, so eventually it will collapse under its own mass and simplified, you could imagine that the, uh, the pressure is so high that the electrons are forced into the cores of the atoms, neutralize the protons, so there's just neutrons in the middle, and then eventually um, from that implosion an explosion will occur. A giant flux of radiation will happen that will have um, nuclei capture neutrons faster than they can undergo a beta decay. So they eventually um, 
Eventually, they are saturated and can capture no more neutrons when a few rapid beta decays, so we're not talking even about nanoseconds, less than that, will happen until they again capture many neutrons. And that's the way that the number of protons actually goes up, and that's the way you produce these very heavy elements in the so-called R process of core collapse supernovae, which is quite amazing. So our reactor fuel and your marriage ring was made in the death of a giant star somewhere. Now, uh, even cesium or plutonium isotopes occur naturally in the fission of uranium atoms, but that's very rare. A other thing happens. Um, the fast breeder reactor, for example, is uh, fast neutrons being captured by uranium-238 instead of the thermal neutrons that usually are captured by uranium-235. Uh, it does not fission, usually, but uh, it becomes uranium-239, quickly decays into plutonium-239, and eventually uh, uh, Neptunium-239, and that has a short half-life as well, and eventually produces plutonium-239. So there are a few plutonium atoms in your uranium ore or whatever, or in your granite tabletop, where uranium cures with the nature. But it's not too much. You can pretty much ignore it. Um, but the thing is, well, we all know that solar power is nuclear power from a giant fusion reactor, but um, there are even uh, natural fission reactors, like the Chernobyl reactor, like our power plants, occurring in nature. And uh, a natural sustaining chain reaction occurred about 1.7 billion years ago with a uranium ore in Gaboon in Africa that resulted in an average of 100 kilowatts output for a few hundred thousand of years. Now, how do they know, do they know this? Um, they mined the uranium ore for whatever they did in 1972, building bombs, building reactors, that kind of stuff. And, of course, they were looking to separate the isotopes, enrich the uranium, and they always found that something was missing. Usually, uranium-235 is existent to 0.7% of the natural isotope mix, and there, in that ore they found there, it was always just 0.4%, and they were like, oh no, somebody is stealing our fissile material, something is wrong here. So they started a huge investigation into that stuff, and eventually found that it's the original ore that has this low content of uranium-235. And the only reason and explanation for that is that there was a natural nuclear fission reactor actually running. Now, back to the differences between uh, the radiation from Chernobyl and Brazil. Of course, you have different half-life and resulting specific activity. Thorium, which has a half-life of 14.1 billion years, versus uh, season 137, for example, with a half-life of 30 years. Um, if you had one kilogram of that, even if you don't take into consideration the amount of atoms because of the different mass, you would, of course, have a much, much higher activity in season 137 than in thorium. Um, and of course, the type of decay matters, how far it goes, if it can penetrate uh, through your skin or not. Um, of course, the biological effects that would result from this, but as we could see, the levels of pure external exposure with total disregard of anything that you can incorporate, just external exposure. If you go everywhere with a, a hazmat suit or something and then expirate a respirator or something like that, uh, you will get a very similar level of exposure if you go to Chernobyl than if you just uh, stay as a tourist. And a hazmat suit would kind of look weird, but um, in Brazil. So what, what else is there cons to consider? Um, of course, the incorporation of radioactive material that results in vastly different doses uh, than the external exposure. Um, you know that this, this radioactive cloud from Chernobyl was spreading all over Europe. Uh, we still have that contamination to large parts in uh, southern Germany from season 137 mainly. Uh, while as thorium and the monazite as well as the uranium ore is rather tightly bonded, it's not as easy to incorporate as these reactor nucleates, not as easily just in the air or whatever. Though, of course, there are um, little parts in every liter of, your, of water you drink, you will have some uranium that you will ingest, of course. Um, I'm not talking about the, the phosphorus from the fertilizers recently, but since the beginning of time, you always have a few... Uh, maybe just picograms of uranium in every liter of water. Um, the natural decay chain also contains a radon, which is a radioactive noble gas, an alpha emitter, and readily escapes uh, the host material. You can notice that, for example, as it is in water, and if you take a shower with something um, like spring water, then you can actually notice a great increase of radon levels of um, 
this radioactive noble gas in the air in your shower room, for example. When radon decays within the lungs, the resulting deuteronuclides are also radioactive in alpha matter, which uh, lead to high local doses. Your skin shields alpha radiation, but in your lungs, when it's in contact with the mucous membranes, it doesn't. So um, actually, radon is believed to be uh, one of the main causes for lung cancer. Why don't the Brazilians have lung cancer all the time? It's weird, but um, well, radon is everywhere. In Berlin, we have around uh, 50 bicarol per cubic meter of air, so. 50 bicarol decaying in this much air, so every time you breathe, you can imagine how much of these atoms actually will decay in your lungs. Um, there's uranium in every brick and stone that produces the natural background radiation. Um, there's also the naturally radioactive potassium, potassium 40, which is abundant with 0.012% in natural potassium. And if you eat, um, for example, nuts or banana or whatever, uh, you get about a dose of 0.4 millisievert during a year just from this natural potassium. And if you want to uh, see more about these natural radiation levels, I suggest that if you have time that you go to the Museum of Technology, which is located at Mökernbrücke. They have a large particle detector, a cloud chamber, where you can see all these tracks of ionizing radiation in a huge chamber. And you can see just how intense these levels of natural radiation around you are. It's very uh, fascinating to see. 20 minutes, oh, okay. Right, <laughs> well, almost done, I guess. Um, now, uh, cesium-137 is chemically similar to potassium. You can see a little snublet of the, of the periodic table here. Um, there's uh, the alkaline metals and the alkaline earth metals, and you can see that potassium and cesium, like the radio cesium, are in the same group as well as calcium and, uh, for example, the strontium or radium. So um, in the natural decay chains, you will find the radium, which behaves like calcium, which again behaves like strontium. And if you incorporate that, it migrates uh, to the bone and stays there uh, for many, many, uh, many years, basically. It has a so-called biological half-life of 20 years and excretion half-life of 20 years. And uh, we know that radium causes, for example, leukemia, uh, necrosis of, of bones in these radium girls that used to paint these uh, luminescent watch hands back in the 1950s. So if there's a large of radi amount of radium ingested, that's definitely harmful. But the low amounts that are ingested when you just eat something after grabbing the sand don't seem to do so much. It's, well, but, well, you can see that, that there are quite a lot of similarities, even though it's a different type of radiation, but you still have incorporation and everything. Now, uh, putting things into perspective, of course, in the initial days, uh, you had a very high thyroid dose during, uh, due to iodine-131. I mean, it's multiple gray of a dose, actually, and uh, pretty much most of the studies that you can find on the internet about that um, link that to a, a great uh, increase in cancer rates that are outside of statistical fluctuations. But interestingly, if you look at enough studies, you will find that this is the, the only thing that seems to be very uh, deterministic, that seems to be very clear. Um, the rates for leukemia, et cetera, et cetera, after Chernobyl. You can find studies that say, oh, we found the same rate of leukemia um, next to whatever, a coal power plant, for example. Uh, while usually you see these, these um, exaggerated movies of mutations, horribly crippled animals, horribly crippled children and everything, while uh, some of these studies claim that these same levels can be found pretty much in every big city due to whatever effects, fine carbon dust, whatever, I don't know. So it's very interesting. And why don't these Brazilians um, have a higher chance of cancer, I wonder? Um, maybe there's, there's a certain dose uh, that is required to be harmful. We assume that any kind of dose, any single gamma quantum can produce cancer in theory, but maybe there's even a threshold for the so-called so -called stochastic damage for inducing cancer, for example. Or maybe it's due to genetics and uh, long-term adaptions in the people of Gorapari just because they grew up with radiation. The problem about that is that since about one generation, since 50 uh, years, people there have cars and free time on the weekends, which they didn't have before. And as you see, a lot of people believe in the healing powers of these beaches. So uh, there's a lot of people actually coming there every single weekend. They leave work Friday and stay there till Sunday evening just to get irradiated on the beaches. And at least those people should not be able to genetically adapt to those levels of radiation. Yet the studies or the, the hospital statistics claim that uh, this is not the case. So I personally believe that the immune system plays the most important role. As you can see, um, 
strange cases of cancer that don't usually happen in people, Kaposi's sarcoma in HIV patients, for example, or a, a much greater incidence of cancer in people that are transplanted and require this immunosuppression. And um, so I believe that it's, it's uh, the immune system mainly, but I don't think the immune system can distinguish between uh, radiation damage, because as I said, free radicals, don't matter where they come from, they're the same, no matter if caused by acrylamide or uh, ionizing radiation, yet when you hear that uh, during a CT scan you will receive um, a dose that equals to about 0.2% uh, chance in your increase for cancer, but if you go on a barbecue and have a, a steak full of this acrylamide, this tasty brown and black stuff on the surface, nobody says you're going to increase your chance for cancer by 0.02% or some stuff like that. Everybody says if you just eat it once a week and otherwise eat healthy, then it's fine. And only if you eat junk food all the time, then you're going to increase your chance for colon cancer, for example. So that's Now, just the theories, there's, uh, which we assume the linear no threshold theory. That assumes that any amount of radiation is harmful. It's the currently most uh, taught study, basically or the most taught assumption, which assumes uh, linear or linear quadratic uh, relations uh, to dose and cancer mortality. Um, and there's the threshold theory as well that assumes a threshold, which I suggested before. And even the hormesis theory that assumes that low levels of radiation are stimulating repair me mechanisms. Uh, for example, sports causes the so-called oxidative stress, free radicals, and all the associated damage as well. But yet, um, low amounts of sports are supposed to be, uh, to be healthy for you, while very high amounts of sports, well, you've seen 28-year-old old football players dying from a heart attack. Not really from cancer, but at least from a heart attack. So. There seems to be a certain dose that is good for you with sports, we all believe that. But um, this study, uh, or the theory, claims that it might even be the case for radiation exposure. But, well, of course you will also find studies that state exactly the opposite, the horribly crippled children of Chernobyl and everything like that. So, conclusion of that, currently, is all a matter of belief. Um, the most important thing is that you shouldn't take everything for granted that science currently believes, because uh, just take the word atom, for example, as from the Greek atomos, which means unsplittable, undivisible. And if you've ever seen footage of the first nuclear bomb explosion created by mankind, then you'll see that mankind was wrong about that. So, um, yeah, it's just important to uh, question everything all the time. So I want to end uh, with a quote from Albert Einstein, who said, imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces the entire world, stimulating progress, giving birth to evolution. It is, strictly speaking, a real factor in scientific research. Now, don't forget my workshop at 2 p.m. Even if you don't get a place for assembling the ion chamber, I have 18 of those kits, uh, you can check out the gamma spectroscopy, live gamma spectroscopy, if you're interested. And feel free to, well, check out my YouTube channel, or drop me a line if you have any questions later on. Now, thank you all for listening. So, Any kind of questions? <laughs> thank you for this very impressive uh, presentation here. Um, are there any questions from the audience?